Test, test. All right. Hello, everyone. I, uh, I'm not sure where my seat fillers are. I ordered a number of seat fillers, and no one seems to have, uh, to have shown up. I took a picture of my last presentation. It looked, turned out pretty well. Hopefully, people that are walking by will talk. You can grab them if you want to, you know, if you see someone you know, you say, stop and grab. This guy, I don't have no idea what he's talking about, but he's got animated GIFs, so it's not going to suck. I know that most of you are not here to see me. You're here to check your email, and that's OK. Continue to check your email. It's totally fine. I'm just, oh, you're scanning QR codes. That'll be the second QR code that gets scanned today, so we're feeling good about that. Uh, my name is Scott Hanselman, and I am going to talk about some things that I'm thinking about around architecture, virtual machines, cloud, and how to build systems today. Okay? And uh, now I work uh, for Microsoft on the Azure cloud, but I'm non denominational. A uh, little advertisement here I do a podcast called Hansel Minutes. So if you like NPR, National Public Radio, you should check it out. It's a lot like fresh air for programmers. And I would encourage you to look at that. I also have another ripoff of an NPR show. This one's called This Developer's Life. It's exactly what you'd expect. Uh, so much so that Ira Glass's lawyers called us and said to knock it off. So I felt good about that. So I want to talk about all the things that make me happy about building systems in the cloud and how I'm putting these things together. Now, as I said, I do work at Microsoft, but I work in open source. I work remotely, in fact. I work outside the Redmond reality distortion field uh, in Portland, Oregon. So I'm safely outside of uh, how they have a, a warped perspective. And I work in open source. I work on opensourcing.net and ASP.net and things like that. And I've been building web systems since the beginning of the web. Building large systems. Before I worked at Microsoft, I built large scale banking machines. Okay? And when I went to work for Microsoft, I started in open source. They called me a sellout. And they said, You're selling out. And I, it made me sad. But somehow I found a way to comfort myself as I made that transition from open source into the private sector. And it's worked out pretty well. Maybe we can cut those lights up front there, my friend. Can you cut these lights? makes the animated GIFs with people wiping their tears with money just that much better. Now, this is before I got working at uh, Microsoft. And here's me after. So it's worked out pretty well building these systems. I love that you're laughing, sir. So I'm going to ignore these people. And now it's you and I, OK? We're just having a chat, just an hour-long chat with GIFs. It's going to be very natural. The one guy that follows me on Twitter is here. That makes me happy. So I want to tell you a story about the juxtaposition between the cloud and the browser and how we architect systems. Architect systems. Now, I went and talked to a gentleman at Intel who is someone that we call a neckbeard. Neckbeard is a gender nonspecific term. If you've done anything for 40 years, you get to be called a neckbeard, like Grace Hopper, who invented the compiler. This particular individual at Intel was a very, very high level person. And this, this individual had been there for 40 plus years, like one of the low digit number Intel engineers. And this engineer said that he wanted to learn how to program for the web. Think about how weird that would feel. You, you know, like you're older, you have more experience than I am old, and you want to know how to be on the internet. Turns out he'd been doing low-level C and assembler type of work. He'd been doing microcode, and it completely missed the last 20 years of the internet. He completely missed the tribulations and all the one-pixel GIFs and all of the nested tables, you know, all that crap. So how would you teach someone with a strong background in computer science about the cloud if they missed out in the last 20 years of crap? So I thought about that, and I decided I'm going to go and teach this gentleman how to do the internet. So this is what I told him. There is this individual. Uh, this is one of those quotes, those legendary quotes by Thomas Watson from IBM. We don't even know if this is a real quote. This is just one of those quotes that people say. And I couldn't even find a picture of this guy on the internet. But I do have this really old book. So I just decided that that was the guy. So we'll just say that that was the guy. And he says, there's a world market for maybe five computers. And what kind of computers is he talking about? He's talking about those refrigerator type computers. Where he thought there would be one per continent. It would be like the South American cloud, and you'd send stuff there. But they weren't thinking cloud. They were thinking frigid air. This has happened. There is a market for five computers, right? There's the Amazon cloud, and the Google cloud, and the Microsoft cloud, and the Rackspace cloud. They just happen to be a bunch of little machines. Come and have a seat. It won't suck. 
There's people who are wondering, by grab a friend, just grab a stranger, call your mom, have a seat. So he said that there'd be only five computers, and this turned out to be the case. This is a picture of Microsoft Azure's cloud. We are a little bit behind. We are losing to a bookstore. I do understand that. But we've got color, so that's working out pretty well. And we're going to you know, get new advancements, and Azure will be awesome soon. Uh, here's us actually upgrading Azure to some of the latest technology. This will run Node.js, uh, I think. And the gentleman was like, well, what does that mean, the cloud? Everyone loves to say the cloud. Isn't that just hosting? Well, I said, let's think about it like this. You are a developer, and you understand what are the characteristics of a system that uh, it sits on top of some hardware. And he's like, yeah, I worked here. I did all that hardware work, no problem. Uh, the characteristics of an operating system that we learn in college is memory management and graphics and networking. When you have these characteristics, you can call that an operating system, and that sits on top of hardware. Okay, cool. So that was where we started. All right, but virtual machines allow you to move from place to place, to pick that thing up, to lie about the underlying hardware, and then move that from place to place. So it's the portability of virtual machines that makes virtual machines exciting. And I asked him, well, how do you get virtual machines now at your company? And he says, well, first we have to fax IT permission, and then they wait two weeks to get a VM. And like, think about that. What a horrible thing to give the magic and the wonder of scalable VMs and put that behind faxing and an IT department. I mean, it was a nightmare, but he was legit saying it takes two weeks to requisition a VM as opposed to spinning one up like that. So you take this idea of scaling and uh, portability and you ruin it with process. I said a real cloud will let you do anything. Even if you want to run Linux and Azure on a Microsoft server, knock yourself out. Whatever makes you happy. Do what you want to do. Okay? You can go up now, and what makes a really good cloud is a collection of software that you can load. So you can go up here. Like This is from uh, Bitnami. They make thousands and thousands of virtual machines with open source software like Jenkins or uh, Asterix or whatever makes you happy. And you can say, I want to make a Jenkins machine on Ubuntu 12. Come on in and have a seat. It'll be good. There'll be snacks later. And you can grab this command here at the command line and then talk to the cloud. So rather than faxing talking to the cloud, you make a RESTful API call. And here I'm going to say Azure VM Create. You know, this could be non-specific. It doesn't have to do with Azure. It's any cloud at all, right? You're going to talk to the cloud and automate it, and you're going to spin up a virtual machine like that. So here I go and say, hey, give me a virtual machine. Put it in the West US. It fires up, and it's got ASCII art, which is awesome. And then I've got a virtual machine. Now, people see stacks like this of boxes and lines, and they get a little confused because a lot of the analysts talk about IaaS and PaaS and cloud services, and it's very unclear. And the boxes and lines get even more complicated. Virtual machines, you manage them. Virtual machines are like a puppy. You have to keep it alive. You have to keep it watered. I don't have a dog. I assume that there's watering of the dog at some point. But you have to, once you've been given a puppy, you're like, hey, a puppy. And then it's like, oh, another thing I have to keep alive. That's what's good and bad about virtual machines. It's like responsibility. A virtual machine you have to nurture and care about and run apt get update and run Windows update on. And that kind of sucks. PaaS, which is platform as a service, or things like websites, where I just want to run the website. You know, like I just want to up level this thing and say, I want a website. And I don't care that there's a virtual machine underneath it. I want the virtual machine to scale the way it scales. And then there's something in the middle called cloud services, which are virtual machines where the cloud manages the, the operating system for you. So you get to decide. Now, this is complicated. I think this is a good way to think about it. Getting a VM and putting it in the cloud and getting it anywhere is your first house. And no one ever realizes how much responsibility your first house is. You've got to fix stuff that you didn't know could break. And that stuff has nothing to do with the basic, I just want to live in this house. Can I just live here? So you put a website out, and the next thing you know, you're patching, what was the heart bleed bug? I mean, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I had to patch a bunch of Linux VMs because a bug that I wasn't really 100% sure bothered, you know, was a problem for me at all. You know, it was something I had to think about. So I manage the operating system. I manage the app. So that's not really cloud. That's just virtual machine hosting. 
It's just lift and shift and put it into the cloud. Now, you can always do the Airbnb thing and kind of rent a room where someone else will tidy up, but you can do limited stuff when you do that. I think that a hotel is the great scenario, platform as a service, where you thrash the room, you completely destroy your hotel room, and then you come back later and it's been assembled, it's been put back together. Feel free, there's lots of room. You might be able to sneak in. There's a few spots up front here. You can join us, have a seat. So with a hotel, there's a limited number of things you can do, right? You can't completely party in your hotel because with your first house, you could destroy the house, but then it's on you to fix it. When you do platform as a service, you can do you know, .NET or Node or Python or Java or whatever makes you happy and then scale it. And this makes everybody happy. Okay? This makes everyone deliriously happy. So it turns out that scaling stuff that's platform as a service in a cloud has turned into a freaking slider bar. This sucks because I'm super old. And there was like two pages of my resume that were dedicated to knowing how to set up a Cisco local director and do like a web farm. Like I was, I was the guy that could do that. Like they would fly me in to configure Cisco products to make a web farm. And then I would tell the people, don't touch it. And then I would fly out and I would feel powerful. And now that is literally a slider bar. That's what the cloud represents. I want three. And then it says, configuring a web farm. And then two pages of my resume disappear. This is what we're talking about when we say a new layer of abstraction. All the science is still there, round robin, uh, you know, uh, sticky connections. All the stuff that we learned about when we were making web farms still works the same. But it's a best practice now. So we've taken the things we learned in the 90s and the 2000s. We've codified them. We've formalized them. And that, that's how clouds work. And every cloud works this way. And that's awesome. That's great. But for me, as someone who was the cloud, like I was the cloud, they would say, hey, can you scale us from one to three? And then I would work all weekend. And then Monday it would be done. They'd be like, oh, the cloud is great. Because Hanselman's working overtime in order to get that work done. That's pretty frustrating. So now uh, the young people, and this is me like with my get off my lawn voice, they're like, oh, this web form's taking 20 seconds to configure. This sucks. You go and say, Updating a server farm. This kills me. There's a line right there. Like my entire decade of experience has turned into a line in an ASCII output that says updating a server farm. And that's it. That was the 90s for me. That's amazing. So I was explaining this to this older person at Intel, and he was like, well, that's great. I don't need to fax anything. I don't have to think about load balancing. I said, no, the Lego pieces that you're using are bigger now. You can snap these things together and plug them in. He was pretty excited about that. You can go up and manage all sorts of websites and do whatever makes you happy. But the part that's exciting about the cloud, I think, isn't that it exists, isn't that you can scale it, it's that you can program to it. This is an example of some of the JSON output of, in this example, the Azure cloud, but again, any cloud does this, is the ability to programmatically do stuff. To go out and say, I need 10 virtual machines and I want to spin them all up in parallel go to the bathroom and come back and there's 10 virtual machines that are ready to go. There's a really great story about what some folks at the New Yorker did with Amazon. A bunch of interns were given terabytes and terabytes of TIFF files, big giant files that represented uh, all the New Yorker over the last you know, 100 years. And they said, make them PDFs and OCR them. So this is an interesting job, but this is a cloud scale job, right? Someone says, do this. N times. It's a for loop. So they go and they write the, you know, the shell script or the batch file or whatever they write in order to make this thing do that work. And then they say, now we need more cloud. And then they scale it up, right? So what they did is they got a credit card. These are interns. They bought 300 bucks worth of cloud time at Amazon. And over the weekend, they spun up a bunch of VMs and they they uh, OCR'd, turned all those TIFFs into recognizable PDFs with the text embedded, and now you can search the entire archive of the New Yorker going back 100 years. Turns out, when I dug into the story, it in fact only cost them 150 bucks. But they made a mistake on the first run, and they had to run it twice. How awesome is that? How would you have done that before? You would have gone, gotten the hardware, right? You are the cloud. You got to go to a PC micro center and pick up a PC, and you hook it up. And you do all of this stuff that we call, the technical term for this is yak shaving. 
You familiar with this term? Anyone heard this term, yak shaving? No one ever? You guys really don't, this is a real thing. Go and Google uh, with Bing, uh, yak shaving. Uh, yak shaving is all that stuff you gotta do before you do the thing you gotta do. You're like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and OCR those files, but before I do that, I need to shave this yak. And your boss is like, what are you doing? I, I am trying to get your problem solved. You are shaving a yak. But it's required to do that. Like you're plugging machines in, you want to figure out how to get node configured, you're messing with packages, you can't figure out why .NET won't do this. None of that has anything to do with the problem at hand. But that's software. It's yak shaving. That was the term that was coined at MIT in the early, uh, early 90s. So when people scale things in the cloud, they are amazed. They think that is amazing. What just happened? So what I tell them, it's magic. Because if you can't have a Shia LaBeouf as Doug Henning animated GIF at Cisco DevNet, where can you, really, I ask you? He thought this was great. But then he's like, well, okay, wait a second. What language do I have to write? Do I have to learn .NET or have to learn Node for this? Come have a seat. You can check your email. I won't even feel bad. The cloud doesn't care about language choice. Cloud doesn't care whether you're using PHP, well, don't use PHP, but if you're using anything but PHP, the cloud will be there for you, because if you're using PHP, you have a problem. .NET, Java, Node, frickin' Erlang, whatever makes you happy. Now, he found this overwhelming, because I told him, you can use anything. Back in the day, what language did you learn? Well, assembler or C? Right? And what you would learn is you learn assembler, they'd make you suffer, and then they'd tell you that C existed. And then you'd suffer, and then they would tell you that C++ existed. And then you'd suffer, and then they'd tell you that Java or C Sharp existed. And they go, why didn't you tell me that before? And I'm like, well, layers of abstraction. You have to learn. You have to suffer first, right? So I told him there's two things you need to learn. When you learn the cloud, you need to learn JavaScript and a systems language, a language on the back end. What is that? It might be JavaScript and JavaScript, right? It might be JavaScript and Java. Might be JavaScript and C Sharp, but you need to learn something in the browser that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, and something on the server. But the, the cloud shouldn't impose upon you to use a particular language. So you should be able to run whatever makes you happy, and the cloud should work, but it should also be transparent and open up and allow you to see what's inside. It should not be a black box. Now, cloud should be open source. A good cloud lets you look at the code. They don't want to hide too much from you. And this is all about layers of abstraction. I said before, you want to be able to run your website where you don't think about the virtual machine until you need to think about the virtual machine. And this is where things get challenging and where I think we as developers need to change our mindsets. Now, my wife has three different degrees one of which is a master's degree. She's in school becoming a nurse. She speaks four languages, and I went to a community college. So you can see that there is a, there's, a, there's a power imbalance there. She reminds me regularly about her advanced education. But she lost her wedding ring down the drain. This is my chance to prove my worth as a husband and then be re-upped for another season. Because I never know if I'm going to get renewed so she says, I've lost my ring, it's gone, I'm never gonna find it again. Do you know anything about plumbing? I know squat about plumbing. But it turns out that the mental model that my wife has, my master's degree having wife, is that you turn the knob and water appears, travels eight inches and then disappears. My mental model has the water appearing at the wall, traveling through the tubey thing, going into the sink, going down under the, and then into the wall, and then it goes into a poof of smoke. I don't know anything about plumbing, but I know that there's pipes underneath. So I go to the curvy one, I'm not sure the word for that, it's technical, and I pull it out, and I pull out the ring. And she's like, that's amazing, you're so handy. I have no idea what's going on, I have no idea what I'm doing, but it turns out I could go one layer lower in the call stack than my wife while still knowing nothing about plumbing, nothing. Does that make me smarter? No, that just means I had one additional layer in the call stack. Similar story, I was teaching a relative how to parallel park. 45-year-old person, never learned how to drive. I'm teaching them how to parallel park. 
they can't seem to do it. They keep bumping into the curb, kind of this weird diagonal thing. It's like, what is, what's going on? I said, well, let's get out of the car and I want you to turn the wheel and look at the wheels and tell me what you think the wheels are doing. And this person said, well, I assume that I turn the wheels and then all four wheels go like this and I want the car to go like this into the parallel parking. I was like, well, no, no, the, the wheel, only the front wheels turn. This completely blew their mind. Like, I'm not saying this is a not smart person. I'm just saying that you go your entire life thinking something works a certain way, and then you're like, whoa, only the front wheels turn? Her mental model was exploded, and then suddenly this person is a great parallel parker. That's why open source, the cloud, is important, is because you want it to just work until it doesn't, and then you have to go one layer down. Because, right, any additional layer of abstraction is indistinguishable from magic, to abuse an Arthur C. Clarke quote. All it takes is that one thing. The plumbing is magic for my wife. The cloud is magic for me until I start looking and realizing, oh, well, it's virtual machines, and there's an operating system underneath that, and it's still the same load balancers that I used to do with Cisco, except now they're automated. That was comforting. I think it's dangerous when we start using the cloud without an understanding of how it actually works. I think that can be a problem. So we talk about the cloud, we put all these virtual machines into context, and we have a sense that we can use any language, we can use any cloud, we can programmatically speak to these clouds, we can spin up one VM or multiple VMs, we can go and deploy things with tools like Git. But the thing that is missing in discussions around the cloud is the browser and the possibility that there might be more computing power there than we realize. So remember this, remember this description of what an operating system is. An operating system has memory management, it has graphics, it has APIs. All of those things, if you have them, that is the characteristics of an operating system. Now, we'll come, we'll come back to that. There was a time when you would sit down in front of that thing and you would talk to the refrigerator that we talked about before, remember? And you would type something here and then it would appear on the screen but it was really coming from the refrigerator in the back, right? It was remoting that, it was, you know, VT, well, I also use Bing, that's probably better, no, I don't get fired. You're looking at a lie, right? You're looking at uh, a browser that is rendering some text that happened to be VT100 that was coming from the back end. But is this machine working hard? The hardest thing this machine has to do is look at the keyboard and make the colors appear. All the real work is happening back there. So then this happened. This is the first page of the internet. This is really cool. I, I, I like this page. This page still exists. You can literally go back to the original URL. They, they switched it away and then they put it back because they realized that it was stupid to put a page in the internet and then break the link. So this exists at its original page. This is the first page of the internet, and this is what Berners-Lee and the folks at CERN did on the first time. And they thought it would be like an infinite book, right? You hear about things like hypermedia. It was a way for scientists to share information. This wasn't an application platform. It was just a way to put text on the web. And then this happened. And how did we know that this happened? Because we were browsing around the internet one day, and then, and then Java loaded. And we knew that it was loading because everything stopped and waited for Java to load. And then these guys were like, we can do it too, wee! And then they were like, but we've got YouTube. We're valuable. But what were all three of these things trying to accomplish? They were trying to do that. They were trying to be a virtual machine that can plug in on top of this book, this infinite book that Berners-Lee put together. They put a square in a browser and said, that's a computer too. And do all your stuff in there and not out here, and that'll be a good idea. It's not always a good idea. I went over to uh, Toyota to have my Prius looked at, because I'm from Portland, and they give us a Prius when we're born. And I was going to get the oil checked. Come and have a seat, y'all. You're going to get my oil checked, and I'm one of those people who's always looking at the terminal, right? Like, you know how when you're getting your, your, your tickets changed at the airport, and you're like, what, uh, what you doing there? Next thing you know, you're standing next to the person. You're like, yeah, I see. How do you do that? I'm that person at, at the Toyota dealership. I want to see how they're doing stuff. I want to see, are they using text mode? Is there a website? They're talking to an AS400? I want to know what's up. So I go there, and he says, we got a whole new system. Got a brand new system here at Toyota. 
and he fires up Windows XP, and I'm like, oh God, and I didn't have the heart to tell the guy. And then he fires up Firefox, and then he loads a jar file manually, and then Java says, are you sure you want to run Java? And he's like, yes. And then Java's like, are you really sure you want to run Java? And he's like, yes. And then it's like, you know, the government really doesn't think it's a good idea for you to run Java. And he's like, I agree. And he signs his name. And then the jar file loads. And the jar file is a terminal emulator that connects to the AS400 that he's been connecting to the whole time. And he looks me dead in the eye and he says, this system is so much better now that it's on the web. He doesn't know. This wasn't what it was meant for. This isn't the right way to do things. It's not healthy. It's not OK. Because what you end up with are documents and then little virtual machines in a box that are little islands of interactivity. But then they require vendors and updates and plugins. And they have security issues. Java was the bomb for, a, not that it crashed a lot, but it was the bomb, like the bomb in the 90s. Like I was all about Java. I worked at Nike and we worked on hot Java machines, like 97, 98. I mean, I'm not trying to disrespect Java. I'm talking about it as applets, by the way, not on the server. It was great. You know, and Serverlight was great for like a week. It was awesome. You know, and then Netflix, and then that's all it is. And Flash was awesome at the time. But again, these were necessary. Why? Because they moved the web itself forward. We lament the deaths of these, new, these technologies, but we forget that they existed for a great reason. They existed because they provided additional layers of abstraction. And actually, I'll tell you another story about layers of abstraction. Did anyone see Adrian Cockcroft from Netflix? He's an amazing guy. So this is a true story about layers of abstraction. Adrian was chief uh, architect for the cloud at Netflix. And he and I were in Norway or Sweden or some Scandinavian place. I can't keep him straight. And he gives his talk. And he's this awesome guy. He's like English. And he looks like Anderson Cooper. And he's like six feet tall. So he gets like plus one charisma just for like showing up, right? And he gives his little presentation and he talks about how they were switching from spinning rust to SSDs. They're changing their storage mechanism from, from platter to SSDs. And he talks about how it was a matter of looking at IOPS, right? Input operations, input output operations per second. In the cloud, they have these numbers that represent how fast your disks are. And it was a matter of, it'll cost me a dollar for 500 IOPS or $3 for 3,000. So it's like, OK, three times more money, six times more perf. Awesome. Let's all Netflix go to SSDs. This is a totally awesome idea. So he presents that, and it's amazing, and he's English, and it's awesome. And at the end, this Norwegian kid comes up, and he says, well, you know, actually, I can't do Norwegian, but I can do nerd. So he's like, you know, actually, SSDs are really unreliable, and they fail a lot, you know, and trim, and they're, and they're arguing with this guy who's got like a PhD in unsolvable numbers about why, hey, chief architect, you're an idiot. You uh, upgraded your cloud wrong. SSDs are clearly not ready for prime time. And he goes on and on and on for like 10 minutes. And then Cockcroft is just sitting there like the perfect English gentleman. And at the end, he says, well, you know, that's not really my problem. I'm renting them from Amazon. The kid didn't even know he was cut. Like, it's not his problem, man. He's renting them. Let's say they do fail. Let's say 30% of the SSDs fail, and SSDs are a bad idea. Is he paying for SSDs? No, he's not paying for SSDs. He's paying for IOPS. He's paying for the cloud, and he's paying for that freaking slider bar. Think about the layer of abstraction that that puts him at. Huh, six times more perf, three times more money, I'm willing to pay, right? It's like buying a Tesla, right? Like, you think you're being green, but you just bought a $100,000 car. So like, eh, OK. But if you can do it, you do it. But you do it with your eyes wide open. And I totally want a Tesla, but that's a whole other conversation. So what was amazing about this is that the kid just kind of stood there like when a ninja movie, when you cut the guy and his head goes like this and then slides off his body and then falls and then the body doesn't know that he's supposed to. And, like, and people were like, you need to sit down. You're gone now. It was amazing. That's the layer of abstraction that you need to be thinking about when you're thinking about the cloud. 
But do you think that he knows all that? Do you think Cockroft is understanding of the underlying technologies? Absolutely. He's made the education, uh, dis educated decision. He's done the research, but then he consciously chose to abstract the cloud away and think about it. And that's what's amazing. So back over to the client side, you want a virtual machine in the browser. It's a good idea. Otherwise, we couldn't keep trying to do it. Why do we keep doing it? Do we do it so we can have physics demos that choke teacups? I remember there was a time on the web when the only thing Java would do was make uh, like, uh, what were those like, you'd have, a GIF, you'd have a GIF or something and then you'd have the mirror image of the GIF and it was kind of going like this and that, that was, it was doing CSS type stuff, you know, it was making reflection animations and stuff like that. And we had this idea with all of these products, whether it be Flash or Silverlight or uh, Java that you would write these in one, write once, run anywhere. And all it did was write once and suck everywhere. And we would debug everywhere. And it was a huge problem. And all the while, this is happening. JavaScript is happening quietly. It's actually called LiveScript. It has nothing to do with Java. It's just really fun to say Java. People like saying Java. It was a hot thing, so we made a thing called JavaScript. Now it's called ECMAScript, and they're trying to make it hip and call it ES6. It's JavaScript, we know it's JavaScript. This comes out, and what are we thinking? We're thinking, oh, that must be like Java. Java people hate that, don't do that. When I saw JavaScript for the first time, I thought it was for doing alert boxes, right? I think we all remember the very first time that we worked with JavaScript. Here's a slide, uh, a flow chart about what it's like to work with JavaScript. The first time I saw JavaScript was when I was filling out a form, and I hit tab, and then it went red, and it said, no, you entered your full security number. And she, you're nodding. Because you know what happened? You're like, because this is what techies do when we see something that's unusual. We hit tab, and we go, I, I don't think it posted back to the server. And then we try it again, and we hit tab, and we go, holy crap. There's a way to validate input on the client side without going back to the server. And then we pull the laptop up and go running around with the laptop. You show your boss, I just figured out a way to validate, da, da, da. and the boss is like, I don't care. It's not interesting. And then we would be like, no, but look, and we type alert, pwned, like in the, in the text field, and you post it back, and like, look, it's cross-site scripting. No idea what that means. But what it did, though, is it had a little bit of client-side logic on the client. It was logic, it was business logic on the client. That was huge, it was meaningful. So then people started doing crazy stuff with JavaScript to prove that it was possible. They would do stuff like this. This is like a JavaScript C uh, Commodore 64 emulator. So someone like emulates a Commodore 64 and then rewrites Flappy Bird for Commodore 64. This person here, check this out. This is a real thing. I'm inside of Chrome right now. This is a complete implementation of a 486 running Linux written entirely in JavaScript. And how do you know, right? How do you know that this is real? You know you right click on it, right? You right click on it so that it, you see it doesn't say about Flash. Because anytime you see anything cool on the web, you right click on it, and if it says flash, you're like, cheater, you suck. With this, you go, you select it, and you go, oh my goodness, this is, this is real. So I come out here to the command line, and I can go and run a C compiler. So now I am running an open source C compiler in a JavaScript virtual machine in a browser on a Windows machine. I did this once at OzCon, and a free software person in the front row was like, TCC, you should use GCC. So then I said, I'm compiling a C program in JavaScript on Chrome on Windows. Like, that's amazing, and you don't like my choice of compiler. So I'm trying to think, like, what can I do to make this person realize that that was a mean thing to say? So what I did, was I go and I open up an iPhone emulator. And then I open up Safari 
and then run a Linux emulator inside of an iPhone on a Windows machine and then compile a C program. Why? Because you freaking can. What's happening is that these layers of abstraction are starting to get to the point, this inflection point where I can start plugging them together in really powerful and interesting ways. So why are people doing this in JavaScript when at the same time that we are learning how to do client-side validation? They're doing it because they want to explore the space. They want to see how far they can go. Can you really emulate a full computer in JavaScript? Let's find out. There's a version of Windows running. Maybe I'll run System 7. This is all real. This isn't fake. This isn't flash. They're booting off the actual ROM. Why the hell not? Because they can. Because it's awesome. And it really works. And it's open source. Now, I'm showing this to a person who made the PC. This is actually what Windows 10 is going to look like. So. Be excited about that. A little more colorful, I think, but pretty close to that. So what else could you do? There's games that you can make. I think it's so funny how you probably have had bosses and business people come to you and say, I'm not really thinking that HTML5 is ready for prime time. Right? You probably had a boss say that to you. Do you really think JavaScript is, a, is mature enough for us to do that? Uh, that happens all the time. And I find it really annoying. And then I show them something like this. This is a game that was the iPad game of the year in 2013. And they went and they wrote it again in HTML5 and JavaScript to see if they could. And the artist that made this particular game was so obsessive that they said if it wasn't pixel perfect, he wouldn't allow it to be released. This is the full game. Where's chapter? It's got touch as well. There it is. So I'll fast forward. And look, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to use my finger. This is written in JavaScript. Look at the, the grass is moving. It's absolutely perfect. So anytime someone says, I'm not sure if JavaScript's going to work for our CRUD application that's going to run an insurance company, I show them things like this, because I think it's important. Now, this might be the time where you would expect me to show Quake running in the browser, because that's what people who do big JavaScript presentations will do. They'll say, oh, here we go. Here is going to show Quake in the browser. Going to talk about how you can take C and you can turn it into a lightweight virtual machine bytecode and then run that through a thing called asm.js and then run the asm.js inside of Chrome. Here we go. No, I'm not going to do that because it's cheap. It's too easy. I would not insult you like that. But you can. But you can. And what's significant about this is that if you take those diagrams from before, the diagram that describes what the characteristics of an operating system are, okay? And then you apply the characteristics that are present in JavaScript. So memory management, JavaScript's got that, got garbage collection. Graphic subsystems, we've got WebGL for 3D, we've got Canvas for 2D, we've got a security sandbox, we've got a tiny database for storage, you've got IndexedDB, you've got a file API, you can drag and drop images, you can do client-side manipulation of images. All of this smells like a virtual machine. The same kind of virtual machine, the same kind of technologies that run on the server side. Now, Jeff Atwood, famous blogger guy, has this law called Atwood's Law. And he says that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript, right? This is totally true. This, is, this has been proven out. You just saw me show you an, uh, an emulator of System 7 written in JavaScript. Actually, a uh, small side note, funny thing about that is that it's actually uh, also true of uh, Excel. You can write anything in Excel. This is uh, an Excel spreadsheet, which is a complete and perfect, pixel-perfect emulation of Pac-Man, where each pixel is a cell in Excel. 
because it's possible, right? I think it'd be cool to see if I could run a complete Windows virtual machine in Excel. The thing about this particular example is that it's actually so powerful that uh, it cannot be stopped. It is impervious. I'm going to have to kill it forcibly. And fu a funny story about that actually, uh, last year for Halloween, I went as uh, Microsoft Outlook. I just took a shower curtain and an opaque shower curtain and I had a thing at the top that said not responding. And I would just walk around and refuse to speak to any of the guests. Who is that? He's, he's Outlook. I totally get it. So given Atwood's law and applying that to mobile browsers, turns out that your phone, the pocket supercomputer you have in your pocket, that is a virtual machine right there. It's got two operating systems, doesn't it? It's got the one that came with it, the Android, the iOS, or whatever. And you've got this other entire world, a complete multi-core capable VM with a jitter, if you do it on iOS and Safari, running on your phone. That's an extra virtual machine that maybe we are not explo exploiting. Now some people, your boss, this guy, might say, well, you know, we bet on HTML5 and it didn't work out. And they went and they wrote their whole Facebook mobile app in HTML5 and they went and they wrote it all over again in native. Because they said it wasn't ready. But then, interestingly enough, a library, a group called Sencha.js went and did Facebook again in Sencha and it was as fast, which said that it was really more of an issue of programmer quality than it was about the underlying technology. Because what's the root of what I'm saying here? Bet on the web. Bet on the internet. The internet's going to win. If there's an argument about proprietary versus the internet, the internet's going to win. But proprietary stuff needs to happen because it pushes the internet up. A lot of people felt like Microsoft killed Silverlight. Well, Silverlight died. It wasn't murdered. It died because it got old. Because the internet got newer faster than Silverlight could solve problems. And they said, oh, we do streaming video. Web's like, yeah, we do streaming video. Oh, we do audio. Well, yeah, we do that too. And then suddenly the water level starts rising and then all boats start to float. And Flash and Silverlight and Java on the client were no longer required. Now, this is a problem, though, for people who think about multi-threading. This is what most computers are doing, aren't they? If you have a regular web page with a quad processor and hyper-threading, you've got eight CPUs ready for you. What are those CPUs doing? Well, one of them's uh, parsing some HTML and the rest are chilling because multi-threading is hard. The internet is going to happen and HTML5 is going to happen though and it's going to give us a virtual machine on the client side. This is another great quote while we're doing quotes called the avalanche has already begun, it's too late for the pebbles to vote. Does anybody know what famous philosopher said this? Nobody? This is, this is the tech conference, you should know this. It's Kosh from Babylon 5. How are you all not going to know ba an obscure Babylon 5 reference? I'm disappointed, frankly, in all of you. There's room up front, too, if you all want to hang out. It's almost done. It won't suck. Now, people say HTML5, but they really mean HTML5 and CSS3 and JavaScript, and they mean all those things. They mean, when you say HTML5, you're talking about that entire virtual machine. You're talking about the entire family of awesome stuff that's happening on the web at the same time. And there's a lot going on. You have to learn a lot. That's a chart that shows just the things you need to learn now if you want to be a web developer. Tooling, databases, backends, frontends. And I showed this to this gentleman, but I encouraged him this gentleman that I'm trying to teach the web, JavaScript. Learn JavaScript. Understand JavaScript. Understand JavaScript. He's like, but wait a second. Don't I just do HTML? Like, there's tables, right? I learn about tables. You remember when tables were the most complex thing that one could know? There was a time when you could walk into a job interview and they'd say, uh, web developer, yeah, do you know how to do tables? And you'd be like, yes. Yes, I do. I'm like, OK, but do you know how to do row span? I'm like, yes. Boom, you're a senior engineer. You're running the team. 
because you know how to do tables. I remember when I finally figured tables out and I was like, I have reached the pinnacle of technical ability. There was nothing greater than tables. And I know when I worked on tables that there is a maximum limit of 32 nested tables in Netflix. Not Netflix, Netscape. And how do you know that? You only know that because you wrote the 33rd nested table and stared at the face of the devil himself and said, what am I doing with my life? I built entire systems on nested tables and one pixel transparent GIFs before it was popular. It was fantastic. It was a great, great time in my life. But now HTML is much simpler than ever. When you say something like, I want to do HTML, it's usually just a div. Let me show you an example of some complex HTML5. This is a great website called CSS Deck. And on this website, it's a learning resource. They have uh, an example, let's see if it comes up here, of someone who wanted to make an iPhone using only HTML and CSS. No graphics, no PNGs at all. And what they did is they made it so you can go and hit play and play this like a movie. So I can hit play and I can watch this individual type and as they're typing on the left there, it will generate the iPhone and you will watch it happen as they do all of the things entirely in HTML and HTML5. Let's look at the HTML, shall we? That's it. That's the HTML. Everything, everything in this example is actually CSS. Turns out HTML is basically nothing nowadays. HTML is simpler than ever, right? It's just structure. It's just a div to hang things on. CSS provides the color and the style. And uh, CSS, we all know, is a rich and powerful language that allows us to express ourselves clearly and unambiguously. We always get what we want. It's an incredibly deep language that requires a little bit of thought. And then you use JavaScript for everything else, right? And JavaScript is great because now you only have to learn the good parts. You can ignore all the bad stuff. JavaScript is a weird language. It is a super weird language. I'll give you an example of why it's a weird language. This is a great book from John Resig. John Resig invented uh, jQuery. He's the inventor of jQuery. So he wrote this book called Secrets of the JavaScript Ninja. And on the front cover is a samurai because JavaScript uh, is loosely typed is the only answer I could possibly come up with for that. That's a ninja, that's a samurai, that's called duck typing. Thank you. I know that was really bad. You got it though and I feel right here this is good. One person got that joke and that makes me happy. In the, in the uh, talking about weird quotes Someone said JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. Who would have said such a bizarre declarative statement? I did. I did. And now I'm, uh, I've made it a quote and now it's a thing. So I went and said that. Of course, it's an obvious thing to say though, right? Like after the fact, you're like, yeah, of course, I've heard that before. People have said that. I said this on my blog and it got on Reddit and it became a whole thing. And people were like, you're an idiot. JavaScript is in no way the assembly language of the web. So I went and I emailed the people who wrote JavaScript and asked them to back me up. I said, do you think it's the assembly language of the web? So I went and I emailed the guy named Brendan Eich. Brendan Eich is the inventor of JavaScript. He wrote JavaScript. That is actually uh, Brendan Fraser. Uh, that is uh, Brendan Eich. But I think that Brendan Fraser is a, is a much better looking man, so we'll just look at Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser wrote JavaScript and he says, well, I said it was the x86 of the web, but I can't claim that it's original. Because it is, right? It is a instruction set for the internet itself that is a, a, a bytecode technique for everyone. And ASM.js makes it possible. Now, people keep trying to write stuff that writes JavaScript. CoffeeScript on the left is what a Ruby person wishes JavaScript looked like. This is not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a statement of fact. 
If you like Ruby, you will feel very comfortable in CoffeeScript. Uh, TypeScript is what a C Sharp or a Java developer wishes JavaScript was like. But the thing that's interesting about these two slides is that each of those chunks of code each generate the same idiomatic JavaScript. They compile or transpile to JavaScript, which is then the runtime language that everything runs on. Right? You want to be afraid, go to Gmail and do a view source and look at what their JavaScript looks like. Because they're writing their stuff in something else and compiling it into JavaScript. Asm.js is an assembly language version of JavaScript. It's a way of saying, here are the bytecodes that we want to use. And you can compile C++ all the way down to assembly language. Now, the problem happens, though, is again, layers of abstraction. We talked about this before. If you let these layers hide complexity, then you are at the mercy of whatever language you use. If you decide to use uh, CoffeeScript, or you decide to use TypeScript, then you're stuck if you don't understand what's going on. People will come in a lot and they'll say, well, I know JavaScript. And I'll say, well, show me how to do a selector. And then they'll start writing jQuery. I'm like, well, whoa, whoa, that's cool, but I want to see JavaScript. I don't want to see jQuery. And they're like, well, you know, jQuery is great. I know how to do jQuery. They think that they're slick and they can do all this cool stuff with jQuery, but they're not. I want to do that one again. I just love that one. That's a great GIF. Now, reminding ourselves of all of these different things, these are all characteristics of JavaScript. JavaScript is a kind of virtual machine. It is our Silverlight. It is our Flash. It is our uh, Java in the browser. It's a virtual machine that lives in the browser that is always updated, that we can count on. But how many of us are using it for anything other than validating a few fields in our databases or doing client-side validation? It's kind of a shame. Even worse, people who do JavaScript don't even know JavaScript. They do jQuery. Who said that? You know who said that? jQuery. jQuery said that. This, I looked up jQuery on Wikipedia, and there's a dude named jQuery. And it actually says, this is about the actor uh, for the JavaScript library, see jQuery. The great thing about learning that jQuery exists is that I have now officially ruined jQuery for you. Like, you're never, from this moment on, going to be able to say jQuery at work without thinking about this dude. And you're going to be like in business meetings, and everyone's like, hey, do you think we should use jQuery? And you're going to be like, I don't know, is he available? We should call his agent. That's the guy. And he is totally salty about me using his name in presentations, like on Twitter. He is not feeling that he's like famous. So I tweet him jQuery questions all the time, just to make sure, just to keep him frosty. Because if your name is jQuery and you don't know jQuery, then what's your problem? You have, you have issues. He did some great work. You can check him out on Chicago Fire and uh, Fred 2, Night of the Living Fred. So he's definitely an up-and-comer to watch out for, jQuery. The thing is, though, you have this image in your mind about what you're going to do. And you're going to use JavaScript to do it. And you're going to use jQuery. You're going to use some layer of abstraction that's far away. And you can visualize it's going to look like this. And then you build it. And it doesn't quite look right. And you don't know whose fault it is. And then you feel sad. So what you need to do, I don't even know, is consider learning vanilla JS. Anyone learning vanilla JS? This is a great, <clears throat> great library. Let's go up here. We'll look for vanilla JS. Vanilla JS, a fast, lightweight, cross-platform framework, right? You can go in here and you can pick what you want. You want eventing, you want math, you want strings, you want regular expression and animations. And it will build the custom vanilla JS library for you. And if you notice down here where it says final size, it will show you the final size of that library. This is a subtle joke, you'll get it later. It's a little bigger when you gzip it. The thing that's significant about Vanilla.js is that this is what you put in in development time. And then when it comes time to go to production, you just change that line right there. 
JavaScript does all this stuff for you. Now jQuery is great, it fixes a lot of bugs. It fixes cross-platform bugs, cross-browser bugs. I'm not disrespecting jQuery. But I am saying that learning jQuery only is like learning an automatic shift car. And I hope that everyone here can drive a manual shift because my parents told me, yeah, people are like, I don't know if I can. What, what happens? You, your dad or your mom who taught you how to drive is like, you gotta learn manual because someone's gonna break their leg and you won't be able to drive them to the hospital and they're gonna die. That's what my dad taught me. And I just think you should teach your children the same. Learning how to drive manual stick is an important life skill just as doing jQuery. It's fine, you can learn jQuery, it's an automatic stick though. And one day, as I said before in that first story, you're gonna drop your wedding ring down the drain and you're not gonna have any idea how to get it back or what to do about that. Because you've decided to live at a layer of abstraction that's a little too high. C Sharp is great, Java's great, hides the sins of C++, which hides the sins of C, which hides the sins of assembler, which hides the sins of microcode and machine code that the guy at Intel I was talking to learned about. I'm not saying know the full stack. Nobody knows the full stack. I'm saying be aware of it so that when the abstraction leaks, you can deal with it. You know, you can expect more from your web tools. You can expect to be able to go and generate a CRUD website and talk to databases and use Node and Ruby and .NET and do all this great stuff. And it should mostly work together. It'll mostly work together until it totally doesn't work together. And then you have to go and figure that out. You gotta dig around it. And if you can do that, you're gonna feel really awesome. You're gonna have a better understanding about how these systems work. You're gonna be able to debug them. And you're gonna be the person that your coworkers go to when they need help with the browser or the cloud. So in conclusion, what I told this gentleman to think about, and I'll show you one more demo, is the cloud gives you that scale, that concept that we talked about at the beginning of elasticity, and the browser is way more powerful, <clears throat> way more powerful than you realize. Even a crappy machine has accelerated graphics. Even a crappy machine has an integrated virtual machine that you can utilize. This is an example of a uh, 250,000, where is it? 250,000 records being presented in a coordinated multi-dimensional view of airline time inside of Chrome. We've got time of day, arrival delay, distance, and date, and then at the bottom here, there's 231,000 things in a table, okay? Multi-dimensional cross-filtering. Watch the numbers at the bottom. How many of you would have thought, yeah, I'm totally gonna do that in JavaScript on the client side? No, you're gonna think about building some business BI system in the back end, and you're gonna figure that those machines on the back end are gonna do all the work. Forgetting that, there's probably two or four processors not working at all on the client machine. I'm not saying take all the work on the cloud and do it on the, on the, on the client. But I am saying when you're sitting around with 10 machines in your server farm and you're like, we should probably add a couple more machines, these machines are not handling the thousand users that are hitting our website. And you're like, I, we only have 10 VMs. Well, you've got 1,000 and 10 VMs and you're sending sorting requests for small lists over to the server because everyone knows the Intel Pentium PCs cannot sort lists or filter information at all. You clearly have to ship that across the internet and all the view state associated with it to then sort that. That's ridiculous. But how many business applications do we have with grids where all the sorting and filtering is on the server side? We gotta stop doing that. We don't need to add more. So that understanding of that imaginary slider bar or splitter bar where one side is the cloud and one side is the browser and the browser has all this power will make your machines a lot more interesting. Now remember I said before, learn JavaScript, learn a systems language. You can learn any language in the cloud. Use one that makes you happy. I use C Sharp, makes me happy. Maybe he uses Erlang and that makes you happy. Whatever makes you happy. But ultimately, without knowing JavaScript, you're gonna be in trouble. So put those virtual machines to work. 
don't have your cloud work so hard if there's something, whether it be visualization or sorting or filtering or chewing of data on the client side. There are thousands and thousands of demos. That example I showed there was of D3JS, which is a visualization library for data. If you're generating graphics and PNGs for charts, no. You know, 1999 called, don't do that anymore. It's not okay. You are not obsolete. Don't feel bad about the technology you've already created. You have a lot more power because you know JavaScript. You know the cloud. So go out there, start programming your browser, get to work. Thank you very much. Scott Hanselman, great job. Thank you.